What did I happen to? Welcome to Strange Detectives. Uh, my name is Xavier, and this channel is all about strange and unusual detective fiction. Uh, and this week it's actually about weird detective fiction as well, um, because we're going to be talking about two novels that are both emblematic of the new weird literary movement. <sighs> Try saying that three times fast. New weird literary movement. New weird literary movement. New, new weird emblematic of the new weird literary movement. That's right, two novels, uh, because this is a rare Strange Detectives double header. Um, I want to talk about China Mielville's pretty popular The City and the City, um, which is like a Strange Detective classic, uh, but I also want to talk about Jeff Vandermeer's Finch, um, which might be slightly less well known, uh, but I think is interesting nonetheless. Um, it's actually been reprinted here along with the rest of Vandermeer's Ambergris collection. Um, and this collection came out a couple years ago, and I just want to say it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, they really knocked it out of the park. I don't know who they are. Oh, it's FSG. Um, well, great work, FSG. But before we get into the books themselves, uh, I have something of a mystery myself that needs solving. Uh, it's a very peculiar mystery, and it used to keep me up at night. Um, although, I'm sleeping better lately, thanks for asking. Um, but honestly, what ever happened to new weird fiction? Was it murdered? Uh, did it suicide? Uh, did it succumb to the frailties of old age? Uh, I honestly had no idea, um, and here at Strange Detectives, we're not above doing a little gumshoeing of our own, uh, so I looked into it. Strange Detectives, case number 0001.04.113.2001. The case of the missing literary movement. So our case begins in the early 2000s, um, when we get the rise of this new literary movement, whose stars are mostly British science fiction and fantasy writers. Uh, names like M. John Harrison, Alistair Reynolds, uh, Jeff and Anne Vandermeer, Steph Swanston, uh, Justina Robson, and of course, the Primus Inter Paris, you know, the chief amongst equals, the star amongst stars, uh, China Mielville, um, who at the time really was the figurehead of this movement. It would be impossible for me to overstate uh, just how personal this mystery is to me. Uh, the rise and fall of the new weird literary genre occurs from like the early 2000s to the early 2010s, uh, which coincidentally is when I was in my late teens, early 20s. Um, you know, exactly the moment in my life when me, uh, an aspiring writer, um, was spending all my time reading, and when I wasn't reading, I was writing, and when I wasn't writing, I was online. And at this exact moment, it seemed, there came into my life this explosive, propulsive, revolutionary new mode of writing, you know, this new weird thing. And these writers seemed just like me. Um, you know, they were just as obsessed with strange and weird pulp fiction, and they were just as determined to, you know, revitalize the moribund categories of fantasy and sci-fi. Uh, you know, we were all going to save genre fiction, um, which really by the late 90s was in kind of this lifeless coma. And their politics were exciting. Um, their politics were almost identical to my own, uh, which is to say, you know, very left wing, uh, kind of radical, um, without being tied down to any particular tendency. And also, just like me, these writers were very, very online. Uh, there were all of these like blog posts and comment sections and forums 
where, you know, famous writers that I looked up to would be getting into these, like, literary flame wars, you know, roasting each other over the history of the uncanny or what it means to be weird fiction or the origins of sci-fi in the pre-modern. And it's like, yeah, as a 20-something, I ate that up. Even on the periphery of peripheries, uh, I really felt like I was privileged to be witnessing the birth of this, like, new revolutionary thing. You know, being online, lurking in these forums, or even going to see writers like China Mielville give readings in person. Maybe it was all delusional, uh, but at the time, I really thought that, like, this must have been what it was like to be living on the left bank of Paris in the 30s. You know, or, like, to have been a beatnik in San Francisco in the 1950s. Yeah, I was young. So what happened? Because it doesn't seem like there was a revolution. Or does it? In trying to answer this question, I came across a long essay by Jonathan McCallment called Nothing Beside Remains, A History of New Weird Fiction. Uh, and let me just say that this is an incredible document. Um, it's something like a forensic analysis of the birth and death of a literary genre. Uh, and it's so meticulously researched and so thoughtfully organized uh, that if you have even like a passing interest in this type of thing, you really should check it out. Uh, because it's funny, when I was reading McCallman's essay, uh, I realized that there is so much of the past which I had just misremembered or never known. Um, and reading McCallman's essay, uh, it really forced me to reevaluate a lot of what I had just taken for granted about New Weird as a literary genre. Anyways, I just want to give McCallman all of the credit in the world uh, because his essay is so well researched um, and he's pulled so many great quotes from the archives. Uh, that I have relied heavily on his essay for pretty much everything that follows. All right, so we begin in the year 2003 on the TTA Press Web Forum, um, where a group of mostly British writers get together to talk about, you know, Britain and writing and stuff. Uh, and what ensues is a 100,000 word posting battle. Uh, when I said literary flame wars earlier, I was not exaggerating. These threads run hot. At the heart of this flame war is the seemingly innocuous phrase, new weird fiction, which I've been using kind of casually, I guess, up to this point. Um, but perhaps I shouldn't have been, because at the time, this very phrase was like a life or death matter to these writers. You know, new weird fiction. What is it? Should it even exist? Uh, these questions were subject to bitter, ugly infighting. I want to give you a sample of the tone of this discussion uh, so you can see for yourself just how ugly it really got. Um, but be aware that for the sake of brevity, I have edited some of what is about to come. Uh, but I don't think I've like over-edited or taken anything out of context or whatever. It all begins when celebrated fantasy writer M. John Harrison kicks things off like this. New weird. Who does it? What is it? Is it even anything? Is it even new? Is it not only a better slogan than the next wave, but also incalculably more fun to do? Should we just call it pick -a mix instead? And here's Steph Swainston's response, uh, which I think is a pretty good explanation of New Weird Fiction and what all the fuss is about. New Weird is a wonderful development in literary fantasy fiction. I would have called it bright fantasy because it is vivid and because it is clever. The New Weird is a kickback against jaded heroic fantasy which has been the only staple for far too long. Instead of stemming from Tolkien, it is influenced by Gormenghast. It is incredibly eclectic, and takes ideas from any source. What is it like to be a clone? Or to walk on your hundred quirky legs? The New Weird attempts to explain. The New Weird grabs everything, and so genre mixing is part of it, but not the leading role. The New Weird is secular, and very politically informed. Today's Tolkien-esque fantasy is lazy and broad brush. Today's Michael Marshall thrillers rely lazily on brand names. The New Weird attempts to place the reader in a world they do not expect, a world that surprises them. So, like I said, uh, Steph Swainston does a pretty good job. I think that's a great explanation. But then Catherine Kramer joins in. Uh, and here's what she has to say. Writers of the New Weird seem, at least in part, to lack the drive to break out and be lifted up to mainstream recognition. Rather, writers of the New Weird enjoy playing with genre boundaries for their own sake because they are a good toy. So, you know, new weird writers like playing with genre. Uh, seems innocent enough to me. Um, but here's M. John Harrison's response. I don't think I would be interested in a game. Games are for people who aren't willing to take risks. 
you play tennis with stuff, you might as well play tennis. Damn, that's cold. Uh, MJH, he's particularly prickly on these threads, um, and he's just heating up. If I don't throw my hat in the ring, then I'm leaving it to Michael Moorcock or David Hartwell to describe what I write. Or, God forbid, I wake up one morning and find you describing me. There's a war on here. It's the struggle to name. The struggle to name is the struggle to own. This is his response to Jonathan Strahan. And Strahan's basic position is, you know, new weird, new wave. Who cares, man? It's all just words. Uh, but it's not just words for these people. Uh, this is life or death. Um, here's Justina Robson coming in off the top rope. This is a war. The winners get all the loot and to name the truth. I think MJH is right. It's also why his stand is pissing in the wind, unfortunately, as none of us has recognized the power of naming. I think that literature is going to come to SF and try and take the entire thing over by main force in the next five years. Compare for interest two recent publications, Jeff Noon's Falling Out of Cars and Don DeLillo's Cosmopolis. Personally, I think the main difference will be that one is fun to read and the other isn't. I think this has to happen, because the world has turned into an SF world. This won't prevent SF itself remaining marginalized and associated with Trek and Buffy conventions. Sigh. Damn, Justina. You put Don DeLillo on notice? Hell yeah. But not everyone is as invested in this life or death battle as Robson and MJH are. Uh, here's four-time Hugo winner Cheryl Morgan with a different take. Labels are marketing gimmicks. The main reason for the new weird. Americans want to know where they can find more like China's. It may be a load of old cobblers from a literary theory point of view, but it is also an opportunity to sell more books and perhaps even secure a US publishing contract or two. So who wants me to claim them for the new weird? As a rule, in any online flame war about genre, uh, there's always that one dude that's going to pipe up and be like, mm, gatekeeping much? They are gatekeeping, they are slay queening, they are doing this in the name of Allah, of course. The role of gatekeeping concern troll in this discussion falls to Richard Morgan, the creator of Altered Carbon. This is the old gatekeeper scam. We know what's good, and if you disagree it's because you don't have the levels of sophistication, which we of course do, to engage correctly with the material. In short, we are better than you. Yeah, right. Look, all I'm doing is looking for a bit of general tolerance here. Taste is a very variable thing, and you've got to be very careful indeed before you start saying things like, my taste is superior to yours, because that way, Margaret Atwood lies. MJH isn't having any of this. Uh, he's gonna shut it down real quick. Hi Richard, that's a view which plays well with editors and agents but it seems like a complete capitulation for a writer. I watched the new wave carpet bagged in the same way, and I'm still disgusted. I don't forgive all those nice, flaccid, mediocre people who diluted and re-diluted something strong and worthwhile, just because, well, they had to make a living. They could have stayed with their day job as far as I'm concerned. I feel your presence here is a break. I feel it is the old-fashioned science fiction superego, whose job is to bring me down and bring me to earth. Not just me, but all writers who want to just do what they want. I don't want that. Richard, I don't want what you want. I resent it. I've had it stuffed down my throat for nearly 40 years. Fatality. By the way, I don't know if you caught that earlier dig at Margaret Atwood, uh, but Atwood features somewhat prominently in these debates. Um, although not as a participant, of course, because, you know, one of the chief criticisms of Atwood is that yeah, she's happy to collect the prizes and cash the checks, uh, but she never actually wants to call herself a science fiction writer. Um, and perhaps it's because she thinks that genre writing is beneath her. Now look, I'm not a huge Margaret Atwood fan, um, and I even met her once, so I can say with confidence that uh, she doesn't care for me at all. Um, and that's a story for another video. Anyways, whatever my thoughts are about Atwood's writing, uh, trust me, they're not one-tenth as brutal as what goes down in these forums. Atwood's stuff is essentially middlebrow books written for a specific, self-congratulatory, post-uni audience whose need for sentimentality has to be disguised as literature. Atwood's engagement with the facts of the contemporary world is as unchallenging as the ruse in Ozone or Updike's in Toward the End of Time. That's what the middle-class 40-year-olds want, when it's a question of science and ideas, or even of real world, real time consequences. Also, this next bit doesn't really have anything to do with anything. Uh, McCormick doesn't include it in his essay, 
Uh, but I just thought it was so funny and so perfectly captures the tone of these debates that I had to include it. Um, so here we go, the godfathers of the new weird literary movement talking about The Matrix. I'm very wary of looking down from the crest of the wave. For one thing, it reminds me too much of the surf Nazis beating on Keanu Reeves in Point Break. Most of us don't come fully fledged to the craft. Look at the crap Shakespeare was churning out in the early years. Hands up, who isn't going to see Matrix Reloaded? If only the geniuses amongst us were writing, we'd run out of stuff to read in very short order. There is always the danger of creating, whether wittingly or not, the kind of literary snobbism we've all been berating Margaret Atwood for. I've never seen such a useless prick as Keanu Reeves in Point Break, itself a film dedicated to undercutting the power of its precursor, Big Wednesday, by the use of stupid unrealistic fantasy about bank robbers. I mean, fuck, I totally rest my case, except to say that I turned down a preview ticket to Matrix Reloaded, because I'd never seen such a load of tosses Matrix. I just don't enjoy seeing people battered for being second rate, it smacks too much of the American winner, loser culture and completely sidesteps the issue of personal taste. Stupid unrealistic fantasy, well, you got point break bang to rights there, but you know what? I still enjoyed it. Hi Richard, Mike is probably on the extreme edge of refusing to accept poor workmanship, but when you have been to a few big American conventions and met loads of authors who expect to be treated like gods because they have lots of fans who love their formulaic, consolatory crap, or even worse the people who just self-publish ebooks and still claim that they are famous, you'll be a little less sympathetic. I will go and see Matrix Reloaded, but only so I can really get angry about it. Anger is good fuel for me. I might get a couple of weeks of energy out of it. The whole Matrix, we are the living state of SF art, thing is, as MJH says and notwithstanding that pseudo-philosophical garbage about, your life choice is the blue pill or the red pill, we're so deep, can chuck in some inappropriate Nietzsche, fuckwitted, but it's hugely popular and the domination of this trope and its pals, never mind the quality watch this stunt, are the central reasons that nobody takes SF seriously ever, 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 To avoid fainting. Keep repeating. It's only a movie. Only a movie. God, rereading this stuff makes me so happy. Uh, it reminds me of a time when I too had passionate opinions about The Matrix. By the way, that was Justina Robson there at the end. Uh, and she's one of these writers who, like most of the new weird stable, seem to have fallen by the wayside or something. Um, which is unfortunate because Robson's writing is brilliant. I mean, she really is a genius, and some of her stuff is really, really great. Um, and thinking about this, you know, you start to understand why there's resentment towards writers like Margaret Atwood, you know? Uh, because some of Robson's early novels, I mean, like Mappa Mundi or A Natural History, forget about it. You know, she's like Philip K. Dick meets Graham Greene meets, I don't know, something weird. Um, but there's another world where, like, these are all-time classics, you know, never out of print. And instead, they're all just, like, $2.99 e-books. Uh, which is fine, I mean, that's life. Uh, but, you know, buy her e-books, I guess. Anyways, where were we? Oh, right, the new weird debate. Uh, and things are just heating up. Um, it's about this time that China Mielville joins the fray. Uh, the Apollo himself. Um, and he says he actually doesn't mind the new weird label. Um, in fact, he kind of likes it. I'm astonished by the number of claims that this label, or all labels, is no more than a marketing gimmick. Undoubtedly, if this caught on, marketers would attempt to use it, just as they do, ad nauseum, with surrealist. However, this doesn't mean that surrealist isn't a useful term, only that those of us who care about what it fucking means have to have the argument with severity on an ongoing basis. Me, I think new weird is currently a useful category, a useful argument, so I'll use it. Okay, so that's China Mielville. Um, but what about Apollo number two, Jeff Vandermeer? Um, what does he think about all of this? I don't think new weird encompasses what I want to write in general. For one thing, I have this idea that I don't ever want to write the same book twice. This of necessity means that even if I wrote a new weird book, I would soon be out of the new weird subset anyway. I'm also wary of possibly limiting myself by throwing in my lot with the new weirds, assuming the new weirds want me. Lol. Jeffrey, you cheeky, cheeky boy. If, if Jeffrey, 
If you wrote a new weird book, really? You wrote The City of Saints and Madmen. You wrote Venice Underground. You wrote the Southern Reach trilogy, and they made a movie about that where Natalie Portman talks to a bear woman. All you've ever done is write new weird books. Unbelievable. In fact, Jeff, in less than three years, you'll be the editor of an anthology of new weird fiction called The New Weird. So, you know, don't play coy. If. Unbelievable. Anyways, McCallman points out that this anthology, edited by Jeff and Ann Vandermeer, uh, The New Weird, um, I still can't get over that. If. Anyways, McCallman points out that this anthology is something of the high watermark for New Weird fiction. Um, because it's kind of like the crystallization of this five-year-long debate, you know, what is New Weird? Well, suddenly we have an answer. We have this slickly produced, very well-received book that you can hold in your hands and point to and say, this, this is new weird. And you know, you can recommend it to your friends, and also you can include it on year-end lists. And so the anthology starts to bring back all of these pent-up anxieties. Uh, because what if new weird really is just a marketing gimmick now? You know, what if this is just a way for publishers to foist the next big thing on an unsuspecting public? Um, and so we're back to square one, and all of the bickering and the infighting have to start all over again. So the new Weird Anthology is published in 2008. Uh, the very next year, 2009, would prove to be one of the most important years in the history of modern genre fiction, uh, because 2009 is the year of the race-fail conversation, or race-fail discourse. Now, the details of race-fail and the race-fail conversation um, are way too intricate to get into here. Uh, but at its heart was this idea that the genres of science fiction and fantasy have these glaring blind spots um, when it comes to writers of color and narratives that don't center white identity, um, and also to non-white audiences of genre fiction generally. Um, and this debate was a massive, sprawling thing uh, that took the form of hundreds of think pieces and blog posts and comments and tweets, and its ramifications uh, for science fiction and fantasy um, were massive, and we're still feeling them to this day. You know, this is like the origin of the reactionary backlash of the sad puppies morons. Anyways, this whole new front is basically opened in the conversation about the limitations of genre and genre fiction. And suddenly, by comparison, the abstract conversation taking place over in the new weird corner of the internet, you know, about genre and marketing, uh, it suddenly seems quaint and out of touch, um, and certainly not nearly as immediate as this new growing debate uh, about the very real structural rot in prejudice that lies at the heart of these genres. Whether or not Margaret Atwood is afraid to use the words science fiction in a Times literary supplement, uh, this seems kind of petty when authors like N.K. Jemisin are out here asking, like, Wait a minute, why is fantasy as a genre basically just a series of race wars between, you know, noble white elves and subhuman blacks? Uh, could we maybe not idolize Helter Skelter as the jumping off point for a little bit of fun escapism? You know, maybe? Come on, let's go! What? Race war! Race war? Come on, Bill! Race war! So after this, the new weird is dead. Uh, there's no one left who's ideologically invested enough in the idea as anything more than like a subgenre or a marketing niche. But you know, maybe, just maybe, uh, its legacy lives on. In fact, this is what Martin Petto argues. He says that the new weird may have quietly won the war. Uh, and what he means is, is that, I mean, the new weird did set out to dissolve traditional boundaries between science fiction and fantasy, um, and these days they do seem pretty dissolved, don't they? Because people really do seem so much less concerned with, like, strict genre classification these days. Um, because it used to be that sci-fi meant, you know, hard sci-fi or space opera, maybe cyberpunk. Um, and fantasy meant high fantasy and swords and dragons. Uh, but these days, I mean, if I told you that I had just started a new series and I was really digging it, and if I had to describe it, I would say it's like an urban fantasy with some sci-fi elements uh, and a few paranormal beats. Um, you know, you wouldn't think that was weird, and you certainly wouldn't think it was revolutionary. 
Uh, because that's like half of YA book talk these days, isn't it? I actually don't know. And you know, when I was doing all of this research, uh, I'll admit that I was getting nostalgic, you know, missing the good old days uh, when weird fiction meant something. But then I remember that I'm an idiot, uh, and that weird fiction really hasn't gone anywhere. Um, I just finished Brian Caitling's Vore trilogy, uh, and that was a surrealist masterpiece, and I loved every word of it. And you know, Danny Denton has a new novel coming out this year, and his debut novel scratched my weird itch. And then I remembered that Susanna Clarke's Piranesi was basically shortlisted last year for like every prize on planet Earth. Uh, you know, was it sci-fi? Was it fantasy? Was it literary horror? Who knows? Who cares? Um, it was great, and it was weird. Uh, and that should be enough, I think. Um, so the new weird is dead, uh, but weird fiction lives on. Uh, and I guess that means case closed. But what about the mystery, Xavier? This is supposed to be a review of strange detective books. Yes, I know, I know, I know. Uh, we're coming to those now. 